Hello, everybody. My name is Dr. H. Fritz Williams, and I am part of the Stark College and Seminary faculty. And uh, I am going to be presenting a lecture on today. And my lecture will be dealing with ministry beyond the walls. And uh, my look will be at Nehemiah as a case study in terms of us doing. Uh, ministry beyond the church walls. Uh, I'd like to begin by making some state introductory statements so that I can go ahead and go forward and continue with this lecture in order for us to get through some of the key concepts that I would like to look at as we look at Nehemiah for us continuing to be uh, the church as well as providing ministry beyond the walls. And as, and as I talk through some of this, uh, my, my prayer is, is that you will be challenged to become uh, not only uh, more serious uh, about your walk with the Lord, but also that you will be challenged to serve the Lord and not be confined to a specific place or area, but that you will be encouraged to go beyond your comfort zone and allow the Holy Spirit to lead you uh, beyond that, that wall of comfort. Shall we pray? Dear God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we're together. And God, we thank you for these, for, for your son, Jesus Christ. And God, we thank you for what he has meant to me in my heart. But God, I also thank you for what he has put into my heart. Thank you for the passion. Thank you for the desire to go beyond and to do more than what even I foresee myself doing. May your name be praised, and may you get the glory out of this lecture. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me begin by saying that this lecture is one born out of, out of great desire to see restoration and reconciliation beyond the walls of the physical church. There are three modules I believe the church must address to accomplish ministry beyond the wall. One is congregational assessment, which is quantitative. The second would be contextual assessment, which is qualitative. And thirdly, a theological assessment, which is pedagogical. Now, the church has been a catalyst uh, for such times within the formative context, such as conventions and associations, but was a church, but has a, ch but what has a church gained beyond the walls? If we were discussing statistics, then it would be quantitative using the church growth question of how many did you as a church reach? And many of us have heard that before. And even as pastor leaders, we have used that to be a proponent for gauging where we have been or where we are at based upon numbers. And I believe we must be move beyond quantity and continue to meet the challenges of doing ministry qualitatively. Because at the end of the day, I believe excellence brings us close to the glory of God. And I believe when we do ministry in excellence, 
or seek and strive to do ministry in excellence, we gain God's attention and therefore we find glory. Now the church has always endured times of poverty, times of prosperity, as well as times of perils. Despite the condition of the wall, the church has been able to live out the call of Christ to be a light in the time of darkness and to provide ministry that meets the needs of humanity, spiritual and material, by fulfilling the Great Commission. Now, as I look at ministry beyond the wall, I perceive there is a traditional perception of the wall as well as a contemporary view of the wall. The wall concept for me comes from the wall builder himself, Nehemiah. I'll share some biblical perspective of this concept later in this lecture. Now, the traditional aspect is more concerned about what goes on inside the wall, mm -hmm. inside the wall, uh, the physical walls of the church and what's needed to sustain inside the wall. Now, the contemporary view is concerned about what happens beyond the physical walls of the church. Now, these two views, believe it or not, have created factions and disruptions within the church or within churches. There may be one faction saying, we should be more concerned about the physical property uh, and meeting the numbers projected at the beginning of the year, while others are more concerned about doing more outside of the church to provide more ministry or reaching those who are impoverished, et cetera. And those questions are like, I feel our church should be doing more. It seems like we just do the same old, same old, same old. Whichever the case, they both have legitimate arguments. Ministry beyond the wall then becomes an issue, I believe, the church must begin to reshift its focus. And as I share some of the biblical perspective, I will also address a question Glenn Lowry asked in Gordon Davies' book on Ezra and Nehemiah. His question is one of great challenge, and it is this. What does it mean for a city not to have walls? This question will then become for me, what does community look like? And lastly, how does a wall function and how is it defined? Now, the ultimate goal when we look at this would be to answer the question, how do we rebuild and in some cases restore the identity of a people who have somehow strayed from being a collective body of believers with a purpose. The threat for the church in this generation is not to lose identity and mission focus. Now, let me begin by giving some biblical background to that of Nehemiah. Now, you will discover that Nehemiah is one of my favorite characters in the Bible, but I believe Nehemiah could be used as a great model for us when it comes to the restorative aspect within the church. As we seek to be restorers or rebuilders or even reconcilers, bringing people back in, reforming connections. Now, Nehemiah, for me, serves as a catalyst for hearing, seeing, believing, and participating in God's program of redemption and restoration. 
He has become the present day voice and example of implementing building programs. The desire to see wholeness and God's glory restored has been the impetus for Nehemiah's memoir. The focus for most is to restore the physical and spiritual walls of the church within the community. The church representing God's power and presence is a source where a community forms identity through godly relationships, fellowship among those who share same beliefs, and where the spiritual and social needs are satisfied. And the beauty of restoration is those who were once in a state of apathy, disgrace, and scattered or diaspora can now experience a revival and participating in forming God's community. We see that in Acts chapter 2 or just the beginning of Acts. Once the Holy Spirit came down, upon those men and women with clothing tongues of fire, and they began to speak in, 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 in tongues, uh, known tongues unto those who were there at the festival. And then Peter stands in Acts chapter 2 and gives that great sermon, and, and, and thousands are saved, and then they begin to form a community to where it's a community like we've never seen it, a community that while there were political and religious walls within the temple or within the temple gates, yet instilled the impact and the influence of Jesus Christ in their lives had them to go beyond the walls. And we know some of that was due to oppression and persecution by not only the religious leaders, but also the Roman government. Let's look more into Nehemiah. Glancing at the historicity of this book of Nehemiah, it is called a memoir, which suggests that it was written to pass on information to others, and most doubtedly, perhaps, according to uh, uh, D.G. Dunn, in the Erdman's commentary on the Bible, uh, pass on information perhaps to the Persian government. Normally, the Old Testament passage passages provide an introduction for the reader of God's word written through a particular individual. Now, the thing about Nehemiah, he does not provide us with patriarchal introduction by sharing the name of his father but he does not give us the traditional prophetic statement of a call or the word of the Lord coming to him. He only gives definitive statement of time and place of beginning. He informs his readers, these are his written words expressly provided for the Persian king and officials. Many of the Persian kings now often noted their good deeds to their gods as personal letter in the temples. And this memoir is an official account to those Nehemiah was subject to also. But the primary purpose or primary response to Nehemiah's memoir is he is writing a letter to God. This narrative of his journey, his leadership and activities in the land of Jerusalem as, as his passion for God and community rebuilds walls. Now, the book of Nehemiah gives us an assessment of the community, answered prayers for the community, benevolence toward the community, and master plan for community. Sounds like community development to me, doesn't it? how the church could be more involved in community development. Nehemiah processed the community theologically rather than empirically. He recognized God as the source for keeping things together and as the architect for restoring the walls. 
The narrative in Nehemiah unveils his burden for the distressed people who had escaped captivity and the broken down walls and the gates burned with fire and about Jerusalem. This burden is personal and to be used as a transformative agent in the work of God building his kingdom. Nehemiah chapters 2 verses 11 through 16 begins the actual assessment of the walls, the announcement to the officials and leadership, and empowering of the people for the work of rebuilding the walls. He had arrived in Jerusalem and after three days begins his inspection of the wall in the most unusual fashion. <laughs> he does not tell anyone, no one. He begins his inspection of wall uh, 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 at night. And after inspecting, he calls all of them together and gives an exhortation or exhorting and encouraging, or shall we say an inspirational message of his assessment of the condition within Jerusalem. He gives his passion, passionate speech about the burden of God for the people and the restoration of the walls shared with Nehemiah for Jerusalem, the distress of the people of the community suffering from identity crisis <laughs> and the broken down walls of the church building representing God's present presence and he and the burned gates of the hearts of men and women has placed a heavy burden to see God's glory restored at or within all churches, not even then, but it helps to even speak to us now how God desires to do the same for us. Well, in the book of Nehemiah, as we know, be really begins in chapter number one. And as it begins in chapter number one, we find that he is in where? Susa in Persia, serving as the cupbearer to the Persian king. He has great concern for the Jews who had escaped and survived captivity in and around Jerusalem. And the nature of his concern is known. Nehemiah's questioning could be a general question that he asked his brother on the surface and initially does not warrant any great impulse. The normative questioning is casual conversation. How are things back home? How are those who survive? Why is he why he desires clarity from his brother? To give detailed information about the severe details back home is really not for certain. And even in doing research, I could not find that out. But one thing is for certain, Nehemiah identified with the diaspora and had compassion and love for his homeland in captivity and those besieged in Jerusalem. Now, that's a good assessment to make right here and allows us to possibly stop just for a second and, and to, if I was to preach or if I was preaching and not trying to give this lecture on this, would be to say, as Nehemiah, even though he was away, far away from his homeland, in captivity, serving under a king who had already besieged the city and besieged the country. Here he is still finding identity with the people. And it's a good point to note, to just drop this in, is that could it be that we do not do ministry beyond the walls of the church because we have lost our identity with the people who are still outside of the walls. Listen, this identification leads to great association with this text. How is this text read and interpreted among those living 
in other spaces in America and feel no association with the larger context of the church. We live in a global society and now many of the communities who were once able to sustain the beauty of the city depended upon those who would uh, obtain a level of success and return home to become viable parts of keeping that community vibrant. Or shall we say that many who left those, those uh, disgraced, unholy places in the community, let me just break it down, they obtained salvation through coming into relationship with Christ. But yet those same drug addicts, alcoholics, those same people who had good reputations, but now because of salvation, they're at another level of growth in Christ, but yet they do not return back to those places to help spread the word of restoration and reconciliation through God, by God through Christ, and yet they are still out there destitute and disgrace and shame. Well, these gateways provided an opportunity to a new world in the same way as Lot in Genesis chapter 13, verses 10 through 13, the transporting of Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah to Shiner and Nehemiah himself. Not too many remain to continue to sustain the vibrancy of communities, especially in disgraced places. The passion behind Nehemiah's love seen in this question raised to Hananiah and some men of Judah. The initial question posed like, normal human interaction when we learn of someone revisiting the homeland, regardless of the situation, when we find someone revisiting those places where we once were disgraced or where we once had life but are now disgraced, where we once struggled and suffered but are now disgraced, we want to know how it is in that same place from whence we've come. And revisiting those familiar uh, with the setting or place ask general questions. One does not expect any shocking information. Things are good. Or things are not as good, but it's going to get better. Due to the fact we cannot Go back in time to visualize Nehemiah face to face. We come to understand based upon what happens after he asks the question. What we, what we left with is to gather from the inference in scripture of the breadth of the question and gain from his reaction to Hanias and some men of Judah's response to his question. These men of Judah, including Hanai, arriving back from that journey, certainly should have information as to the conditions of the homeland. The extent of their journey, not shared in scripture, or any knowledge gained in research as to why of their journey. One thing is for sure, they were able to give a distinct summary to answer Nehemiah's question. Well, Nehemiah's reaction in verse number four, unexpected response to Hannah and I, Nehemiah's brother, the remnant there in the province who survived the captivity are in great distress and reproach, and the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are burned with fire. And I gives a response we can begin to visibly see in chapter one, the possible response of Nehemiah in verse four. The unfolding of this conversation reveals the unique 
uniqueness and form of writing Nehemiah imposed upon his reader and past and future. He uses the narrative form of writing, gives a personal account of the intent of this question. The response to the question receives quite an emotional uproar and sends Nehemiah into a physical and spiritual upheaval. He weeps and mourns for days, fast and prays before the God of heaven for days. Now here are two entities, a city or urban center state and a man in the raw service of the king in crisis who learns in who, who learns his homeland is in trouble and the gates burn with fire and the wall is broken down. The great concern of this great man is similar to mine and many others who have passion for their current or prior context. And the question looms, what does it mean for a city to have walls? Glenn Laurie, an African-American leader, shared with his people the following applied reading of Nehemiah chapter 1. And from that, we learn in Glenn Davies, Gordon Davies' book, what does it mean for a city not to have walls? Well, for me, hopefully for you, as you listen to this lecture, Laurie's question resonates within uh, and, and great ethos in his thoughts and exegesis of Nehemiah's memoir. The church, let me say this, the church, regardless of ethnicity, within these communities has to face the threat of upheaval and destruction and rediscover what does it mean to have a wall or a church? Well, we know Nehemiah prays day and night to God for the children of Israel. He inquires uh, of God to hear and to see prayer, uh, see the prayer of his servant. His prayer, which is full of Deuteronomy uh, expressions, acknowledges the sins of the Jewish people, but calls upon God to fulfill his promise uh, in view of the repentance of the people and to grant his servant, servant Nehemiah mercy before this man, the king. Well, the narrative unveils the sin condition of the people and how they have not kept God's commandments. That's the reason why they were in exile anyway, right? And the Bible reveals in the writings of three major prophets, Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Jeremiah, the seriousness of the violation and God's judgment upon the violators. But Nehemiah stands in the gap. Isn't that beautiful imagery there? there? There is some uniqueness to Nehemiah's narrative, unlike many other singular author books within the Bible. He does not reveal a prophet or priestly call anywhere within his narrative. And yet he has a desire for God to intercede on his behalf and those who were reaping, who, those who were praying for praying the same prayer. He apparently desires to be used by God to bring about a change by starting at the end of chapter one, that he was a cupbearer to the king. You know, I love the black church. And one thing I love about the black church is the imagery and the imagination and the creativity that comes from not only doing proper exegesis, but being able to lift it from the pages of the Bible to make practical expression. And if I were even teaching my class in methods of biblical interpretation, I would, I would, I would dare to say that Nehemiah, as he, as he begs God, as he intercedes with God for 
for God's people that Nehemiah bears some Christ likeness and how Christ, as we say in our expression in the African American church, when God could not find anyone else who would go, he asked Abraham, would you go? He asked, he asked Moses, would you go? But uh, he asked David, would you go? He asked, uh, 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 he asked Elijah, would you go? He asked, uh, he asked several others, would they go? But all of them had imperfections. And I'm not saying that Nehemiah does not have imperfections, but what I am saying, that Nehemiah shows us a Christ-likeness that, that even when we're in the preaching expression in the African-American church, we say, but there was one who was up in heaven who said, Father, if you cannot find anyone else who would go, I will go. And here it is, Nehemiah is accepting the challenge to go and stand in the gap. And he discovers one thing, that he is the cupbearer to the king. And as long as he understands his position, that God would grant him favor before the king. I don't want to bore you too long in this lecture in this, but this is some good stuff. That Nehemiah consumed with emotion over the condition of the walls and desolation of his father's homeland, his heavenly father's homeland, as well as his physical father's homeland, over a period was developing a strategic effort to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Now, how to accomplish the rebuilding project? By approaching the king, he, he, he knows only King Artaxerxes can provide the approval and resources to allow such a task to come to pass. Some months have passed. Now he's before the king taking up the wine to his, his normal function. The king notices an unusual demeanor upon Nehemiah's face. He asks about his depressive look, and Nehemiah responds, sharing with the king uh, the nature of his sadness. Jerusalem is desolate. The gates are burned down or consumed with fire. Uh, the king responds to him through inquiry. Nehemiah prays to God. Quick prayers are possible and valid if one has prayed sufficiently beforehand. Listen, the king hears his request and the details of the request and grants Nehemiah the time, treasure, and talent needed to fulfill the mission of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. Now, I have to say this, in community development, as we seek to do ministry beyond the walls, that's what community development is all about. It's it's being, knowing your identity, praying, being a good disciple, praying. Now, I'm rushing ahead of myself in this lecture, lecture but, but, but praying, being a disciple, understanding who you are called to be, who you are now, and being a light in the midst of darkness and being able to be yourself. And as you, as you form this collective, your collective is able to do more than just one of you. But here, Nehemiah understood that he was the one to stand in the gap. And sometimes it may only be one. But listen, whoever you are, use what you have to the fullest as God has set you in places to do ministry beyond the wall for the cause of Christ. Now, I'll rush ahead of myself a little bit, but, but I get excited about it. But listen, let me continue on. Nehemiah arrives, in within, with, Nehemiah arrives within the boundaries of the Persian rural territories and presents these letters to the governors who are in rule of the territories. Now, one would assume uh, the governors would cooperate since Nehemiah arrives with official signed and sealed documents with officers of the Persian army along with riders. Instead, they become suspicious, displeased with the thought and actions of someone uh, having concern for the country Israel not just the city and its walls, but for the entire country, right? 
listen, I must say this, when one is on a mission for God, there will always be opposition. I must say this to the social construct of the, of the day as we look at ministry beyond the walls. There are movements that are going on that seek to provide equality for those that have been disenfranchised or those who have been abused or neglected or treating uh, uh, or being treated uh, as not equal. And some of those movements are created from within the church to move beyond the wall. Because the greater body of the church, regardless if it's ethnicity or regardless if it's denominational like, uh, like evangelicalism, does not always provide ministry beyond the walls for all people. And here we see Nehemiah, regardless of who it is, he comes back with the mindset and the focus to restore Jerusalem not just for those who are of Hebrew uh, 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 of Hebrew descent or Jewish descent, but he comes back to rebuild the walls for all people because he understands that all people identify with the one and only true God. Listen, Nehemiah draws attention draws their attention. Do you see as he calls for them all together, as he gets them all together, he told no one of what was going on when he got back, went to his little hotel room, got in his room. Everybody's trying to figure out why is he here. Nehemiah doesn't tell anybody. While everybody else is asleep, Nehemiah goes to work. He does his assessment. And as he does his assessment, he comes back. And for three days, he does this assessment. And when he comes back, he, after doing his assessment on the fourth day, he draws their attention. Do you see how bad things are? The desolation and the shame. He continues by influencing them. Let us rebuild the walls. And in verse 18, the hand of God, of my God, has been favorable. Let us arise and build. And they put their hands to work. Listen, we have to get busy rebuilding the wall. We have to get busy in the ministry of restoration and reconciliation and in troubling times as we're in right now. It is time for the church to say, to drop their anchors. Or maybe, maybe we should just cut our anchors, let loose our anchors, and sail into territory that we've never been in, maybe even new territory that we may not be in. Even as pastors, maybe we need to cut sails or, or maybe we need to lift our sails and travel across the country or travel across the street or travel into a different neighborhood that does not look, for, look like us. Maybe we need to do like Star Trek and go to a place that we've never been before and allow God through his Holy Spirit to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we could ask or even think. Nehemiah returns back, and he understands that the devil is working through Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem. You have to turn back to some people and say, listen, you have no part in our prosperity inheritance and in the history of what, we will, be, what will be written. And the beauty of this text is the great narrative to be read and written in the lives of all those who would give themselves for service for God and his kingdom? Will they see the importance and rebuild the wall? Now listen, I would like to give you some key disciplines for the next few minutes, some key disciplines on what it takes to provide ministry beyond the walls. 
I will just share just a little piece on this and then hopefully move toward uh, the last piece that I would like to talk about when it comes to theological assessment, which I am doing some of that even right now. Listen, I believe one, leadership is a key. Leadership is a key, excuse me. Leadership is a key. Listen, the book of Nehemiah gives the reader a narration of his inspiration to return to his homeland and rebuild the walls that had been burned by fire, basically destroyed. This is an important point for me. Nehemiah is a prototype for pastors or leaders to find inspiration in God, community, principle, and practice. He did not have a traditional call or spiritual incantation as many of the prophets and servants, and even like many of us as pastors and, and leaders. But what he did have was the purpose, the passion, and he put it into practice. Purpose, passion, prayer, and he put it into action. That's four keys right there. Purpose, passion, prayer, and practice. Those are four key important disciplines. Very key. And if I had time, I would even talk about Nehemiah as a standard for spiritual formation. Because as you look at Nehemiah, Nehemiah serves as he has identified, he knows who his God is. He not only had good parents who instilled in him the word of God, but were also good uh, practicers of what it meant to be uh, godly examples who shared that he had good Sunday school teachers, I'm pretty sure. And as he got older, he did not leave from his foundation. He not only took his nationality as important, but the beliefs within his national group had a place in his heart that he lived by. I'm pretty sure he learned of Daniel and the three Hebrew boys, that even if you get chosen above the rest to, to serve in service, even in captivity, to, to maintain your beliefs in who you are, as well as in your God, and most of all, in, in your God. Well, secondly, I'd like to talk about another discipline, which leans upon restorative or restoration the theology. And restoration theology is a term developed as a result of the restoration movement that took place in the early 19th century across America. And this movement called for a, an alignment of Christian processes and values to denounce the divisions found among various denominational groups. As a result, restoration theology was birthed, calling all New Testament believers of Christ Christians. Listen, a group known as Kingdom Now and or the Restoration Movement insists that the church is to become unified and mature under the government of apostles and prophets such as Manuel Gutierrez, Bill Harmon, Earl Pollock, uh, Rick Joyner, Cindy Jacobs, and Charles Peter Wagner and an apostolic association such as Apostolic Council uh, uh, for Educational Accountability and take control of secular institutions uh, sufficient to demonstrate that the church embodies the authority of Christ. Now this theology called for a restoring, this is what's important for me, that it called for a restoring of core and fundamental values of apostolic Christianity, meaning that we go beyond the walls, be led by the Holy Spirit, and to be able to do things as God gives us power to do them. 
and establish it. And this non-denominational approach to church fellowship was meant to unify the people and strengthen the gospel message. And listen, a few of those classic theologians who served as the forerunners of this movement in theology are Barton W. Stone and Thomas Campbell. Now, this is, these are the pieces that are important to me as I give this lecture on today, that restoration theology may be applied to the story of Nehemiah as he exemplified a unified approach to restoring the walls with a common goal. Nehemiah also fostered a passion for restoration as he applied or appealed uh, his case to his king and solicited help from the fellow Israelites upon his return. Another key discipline I'd like to look at is this, liberation theology. Poverty is the single biggest hermeneutic tool used to recontextualize the Christian faith into libera liberation theology. According to David Turner, an introduction to liberation theology. Poverty for the liberation theologian is sourced because of sin. The theologian or theologians of liberation wholeheartedly affirm that sin is the fundamental alienation uh, uh, for the root of a situation of injustice and exploration. According to Dennis Carroll, what is liberation theology? This theology compels Christians to think, think beyond the traditional parameters of legalism of the scriptures about right and wrong behaviors and engage the world with a social consciousness. It was, it was within the bleak social and political environment that liberation theology developed, growing out of the reflection of Christian poor uh, on their social and political situations in the light of the Bible and their Christian faith, according to Victoria Harrison, Religion and Modern Thought. The goal of liberation theology is to provide freedom to the marginalized and oppressed. For the liberation theologian, sin is the culprit of the issues surrounding bondage and injustice in the world. And the goal of the forerunners of liberation theology is that as they share with the world, the world will hopefully respond with positive changes accordingly. Society's culture has everything to do with accepting behaviors, giving credence to traditions and trends. Sadly, culture is influenced by the majority of those in the position of influence and constituents constitutes a standard of acceptable behaviors that are accept, set, expected to be followed by all. Culture influences mindsets and choices not easily change without the consent of the masses. There is a democratic approach to culture as the majority of persons in positions of power are the ones who sanction the acceptable behaviors, beliefs, and mindsets of all. Now, I got to say this, this theology compels Christians to think beyond the traditional parameters of legalism of the scriptures about right and wrong behaviors and engage the world with a social consciousness. It is within, even within the bleak social and political environment that liberation theology developed growing out of the reflection of the Christian poor on the social and political situations in light of the Bible and the Christian faith. Listen, the goal of liberation theology is to provide freedom to the marginalized and oppressed. For the liberation theologian, sin is the culprit of the issues surrounding bondage and injustice in the world. I have to say this, it's a quote by Patricia Haley, uh, in her book, Desperate for Authenticity, Authenticity, a critical analysis of the feminist theology of the feminist theology of Virginia, Ramey Mollenkopf. Freedom from oppression, 
or any minority people in a society or circumstances is considered to be salvation in liberation theology. Sin consistently is understood as anything that prolongs this oppression and others and perpetuates the power structures which force oppression. We have a long way to go and we have some work to be done. Let me finish by uh, just going over just these couple and I don't wanna bore you too long. Listen, one more discipline or two more disciplines is this, the theology of prayer. It's offered as a systematic discipline that when intentionally applied results in divine connection and restored spiritual awakening with, with God. This concept of experiencing the miraculous as a result of prayer is evidenced throughout the Bible and shown effective whenever applied. Many of us have even done that. Classic theologians agree that discipline of prayer associated with meditative exercises encouraged by the Holy Scriptures for, uh, for the regular practice by every Christian. I love Dr. Howard Thurman. Uh, even in some of his meditative works. Uh, uh, I love uh, Carl Rohr, uh, uh, even in some of his meditative works, because prayer will get you there. Regimented prayer may be applied to the story of Nehemiah as he exemplified meditative behaviors upon his return to Israel as he surveyed the land for the first three days of his stay, he did not jump into work immediately upon arrival, but waited three days to appraise his situation. And when he did set to business, he did not hold a telepress conference, but kept his goals largely secret, even doing reconnaissance under cover of night. His independent observations and intentional solitude portray Nehemiah's pensive, thoughtful posture. God did not merely open the way for Nehemiah. He also attained, obtained for him from the king full authority and provision to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. All this came through prayer and fasting. My God. Modern theologians often compare Nehemiah's approach to the concept of regimented prayer with successful results of his, of his quest. Last but not least, let me talk a little bit about organizational leadership. Organizational leadership. Listen, the concept of organizational leadership often associated with the business concept of professional management. Organizational leadership, however, is respectfully multidisciplinary as it focuses on cultivating the relationship between leadership and the organizations that follow. This is important for me, and it comes, it's a quote that comes from Greg Oden and, and Daniel Meyer in Leadership Essentials, Shaping Vision and Multiplying Influence, Defining Character. Servant leaders empower others through modeling. They motivate others by their own example. Instead of driving people through overbearing authority, servant leaders draw them through an attractive life. This concept evident throughout the Bible through the inception, growth, and ongoing development of the New Testament church. Organizational leadership may be applied to the story of Nehemiah as well, as he exemplified strong communicative skills, his personal objective was clear, and therefore his message to others was justified effectively. Nehemiah also had to lead in the midst of opposition as he, as, uh, as he and his group were being harassed by the enemy to try and stop uh, their progress of rebuilding the wall. Now, modern theologians often compare Nehemiah's organizational leadership with the fearless faith in God's divine will. To those who are called, lead with integrity, 
work with renewed vigor, and love the people we have been entrusted to shepherd with the agape likeness of Jesus our Lord and Savior. <clears throat> Nehemiah performed a uh, uh, Nehemiah performed a, a, a great feat. He rebuilt the wall and reaffirmed the people with in 52 days. The 21st century church can use a similar blueprint uh, from the book of Nehemiah to restructure and realign ministries in record time. It's a sobering, so sobering, 52 days. And we take a year, a whole year to just restructure some stuff. But when you lead by example as a servant leader and you begin to win the hearts of men and women, you could do the same. We can do the same. Listen, theology helps to connect organizational leadership with restoration effects as collective efforts. When clearly defined by leadership, uh, and matter of fact, the last quote, let me give it to you, to those who are called, as I've just read it, uh, was written by uh, Georgette uh, Prime Godwin, uh, ne ne the, Nehemiah, the Nehemiah Prototype Complementary Guide to Organizational Leadership. Listen, theology helps to connect organizational leadership with restoration efforts as collective efforts. When clearly defined, by leadership can result in successful outcomes. Likewise, the act of evangelism is influenced by organizational leadership because of the great commission goal made by Jesus Christ to every believer to communicate. This communication, however, was very specific to the spreading of the gospel message to make what? Other disciples. Christ's ministry of discipleship and the cross meant the multiplication of himself in the believers. His ministry was the establishment template for all who would follow in Christian leadership. Inclusion, filling the void, and bridging the gap between God and the Father and man was always his goal. And that is from E. Labman, the grown-up church, restoration of the New Testament church. Listen, my brothers and sisters, uh, thank you for participating in this lecture on today, Ministry Beyond the Walls, Nehemiah as a case study for the church. Listen, I would like to leave you with this one last thing, is just even as the last quote stated, One thing is, not only is Nehemiah a good, uh, a good book to use in terms of spiritual formation, but even when we look at it organizational leadership-wise, it's even better to use as a book or a premise for discipleship. Christ calls us to be his disciples, and organizational leadership is a place to where we become Christ-like. We become servants who become models in order to encourage others to take up their cross and follow, up as, follow us as well. Jesus says this to Peter in Matthew chapter 16. He says, Peter, you're right. Flesh and blood has not revealed this unto me. He said, no longer are you Petra, but you are now called Peter the rock. Uh, because flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. He said, and I will give you the keys. Listen, my brothers and sisters, after that, he then tells them, take up your cross and follow me. And that's the challenge for all of us. And I believe even Nehemiah heard that, even in the Old Testament, that as he studied the law, he came to understand that the law meant not so much these other things that many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees had painted, but he came to understand that it was to be more like God. And so are we too, because of Jesus, 
We are to be more like God, but thank God we can through Jesus Christ who died for our sins, who now becomes our model. And because he lives inside of us, we now take upon that Christ likeness and we try to be those same models, not depending upon our own strength, but the strength that he empowers us with to be the same beyond the walls of the church. May God bless you and keep you and thank you for listening in to this lecture. And we pray that you will continue to read the book of Nehemiah because it sheds even more light on the great feat that he did in restoring and restoring the wall and reconciling the people. God bless you is our prayer.